My name is Doris Fuyun, Senior Futurist at the Institute for Futures Research, and I have the privilege of speaking to Roger Spitz. Now, Roger has a very impressive CV. Hello, Roger. Nice to have you here. Hey, Doris. And great to be with the Institute for Futures Research and with you. Cool. Now, you have very impressive thing, things that stand next to your name. You are the founder of Tech Essence. Stanchel, you're the chairman of the Disruptive in Futures Institute. You live in beautiful San Francisco. I like you for two other things as well. You're a member of the Association of Professional Futurists, and you were born in Johannesburg. Yes, absolutely. It's a, and for me, it's really wonderful to be spending a bit of time with you and with the Institute in Stellenbosch, and also, of course, the connection with South Africa. We are going to say a few words about artificial intelligence and a little bit about the COVID-19 crisis and whether the two of them had anything to do with each other. So let us fly into our topic. So, Roger, in your view, what has emerged in terms of AI's capabilities during the pandemic, if you now look at what, what has been emerging? Are there stuff that you are seeing? Yeah, so three, four points. I think the first one, which is interesting, anecdotal, but but still interesting, is that it's actually a, a Canadian startup called Blue Dot, which was the first one through natural language processing and machine learning to actually spot the virus before the US Center for Disease and Control and Prevention. So that, that was, you know, some time ago, but it was actually spotted um, by, by effectively artificial intelligence. Um, there was a second early piece of maybe you know promising developments in in march 2020 when google's deep mind um, applied its neural networks to predict the shape of vital protein structures based on the virus's genetic sequence so that was an important step um, <clears throat> to help understand better the virus and, and some hope around that and then i'd say more generally you know, it's a huge achievement that so many vaccines are being tested after a few months of the start of the virus. Um, there were some that were starting to be tested, you know, literally months after the beginning. And even though it's a long process and it feels very slow from, you know, the, the whole world and the situation the world is in, normally vaccines take, you know, years, if not decades to develop. So I think overall, it's played a very important role in terms of as, as a catalyst to, to be able to combine data with so many, you know, experimental and real world sources to monitor the mutations. And literally the, the AI drug discovery is going through billions of decisions to try and find the right monocles and infinite simulations. And that is, is accelerated, let's say, through AI. And, and our expectations about what AI can do, is that shifting a little bit at all in your experience? So I think for professionals, probably not, because I think, you know, the people who are really in the science community and the people who really understand AI and drug discovery and vaccines, probably not. But I think for a lot of the world, you know, they, they wake up to realize that AI can't really replace the most crucial time consuming aspect of vaccine development, which is the trials. So really understanding that the human body is pretty complex and that models can't reliably predict you know what a particular vaccine will do for the body mm -hmm. having said that there are two interesting comments maybe on that note one is that um Daso system which is a european and us um large simulation company you know competitor to siemens or autodesk they bought a company called metadata for seven billion dollars which is a software company which analyzes clinical and biotech trials for some of the largest drug makers. So there's a question as to one day one might be able to, you know, virtualize clinical trial technology. We're certainly not there yet, and I'm not suggesting that it's a direction, but when they acquired that company and given the amount of data over decades um, working with the largest drug companies, I'm sure they have in mind to see whether there's even the clinical part that's conceivable to, to simulate. And then the last thing I would say is that even though it wasn't related to the pandemic, out of MIT, there was actually the first antibiotic discovered using AI called Hallison, and machine learning found molecules that um, even help formerly untreatable bacterial strains. So they are today in the market successors of, um, you know, effectively some of these antibiotics or other drugs discovered by AI and used effectively. Wow, that is seriously impressive. 
In many other fields, we are learning interesting lessons throughout the pandemic. Are we learning interesting lessons about AI as well? So I guess the answer is, is always, especially with something which is so polarized in terms of opinions and perceptions as, as AI, in terms of whether it works, doesn't work, whether it even exists, depending on the semantics, whether it's effective. But to my, from a personal perspective, one of the things I observe is really the choices um, society and governments will need to make in terms of what's working and not working and what's the, the desired effect. And in particular, when you look at you know a lot of talk around contact tracing, a lot of talk around um, the lack of effectiveness of the testing, the tracking, the tracing, the quarantine processes, which felt a little bit ad hoc in most of the world. One of the questions I have is how much of it is AI not being effective or how much of it is choices we're making in privacy and ethics, which are the right choices, of course, to be very cautious on that side. But I do wonder whether if you take China, which obviously has limited, if no safeguards and look more, you know, less concern on some of these topics, such as ethics and privacy, actually it's working very well, the tracing. And so the question for me is, has the West, you know, whether it's GDPR in, in Europe, which provides constraints to being able to test and use and own data, whether it's the UK, which actually has put in quite important legislation, which are not going towards privacy in terms of the retention of fingerprints and DNA profiles for the interest of natural security, whether we are actually a little bit in the worst of both worlds. In other words, we don't maybe realize that we don't have privacy and we don't have a strong ethical framework. We have these big commercial companies and governments and it's a little bit ad hoc. And actually we don't maybe achieve the objectives of ethics and privacy in, in a real way. At the same time, the governments are behaving a little bit randomly and poor decision-making, lack of leadership and execution. And we end up maybe with the worst of both worlds because if you take the example of the, the, the tracing and, and those elements, you know, I don't know whether it's necessarily that the constraint is on the other side of AI. <laughs> we always touch on the people in the end and what would the exactly. people do. Talking about AI and people or AI and humanity, being futurists, we always think about what could lie ahead. So yeah. your views on plausible futures for AI and humanity? Yeah. So there are, three, there are three filters I like to apply for that very important question in terms of where things can go. The first one we just touched upon briefly, which is privacy and ethics, and where you need a very, very thoughtful balance. And here, you know, you have people whom I admire immensely, like Yuval Harari, who talk about humans, you know, becoming hackable and the fusion with technology and biology. And so here, you know, humans are becoming products and data, um, and I think there's a, you know, there are two futures, well, there, there are many futures, but there are two futures I think of. One, which is we almost draw all the drawbacks and inconveniences on ethics and privacy because they don't get addressed, they're complicated topics, and we end up without the right kind of framework or safeguards, but without any of the advantages. And so that for me is almost like a worst case scenario. And then, of course, there's the other extreme, which is not either good, which is everything falls into line, more of the Chinese or, or even pushed further model, where basically, you know, you can end up with very dystopian views if, if it's in the wrong spectrum. But I'm, I'm not sure that the kind of status quo where the world is in, where we let AI progress without the safeguards is necessarily a better, a better outcome. But um, then the second area I think about a lot is, and not, not just me, of course, is the geopolitical, which is, you know, you're seeing a lot of the large tech companies here, Amazon and IBM doing the right thing in terms of limiting surveillance if they don't have a good understanding of, of how the technology is applied. But then when you look at China racing ahead without these safeguards and China's AI national competitiveness on a global scale, you then need to wonder what the world dynamic geopolitically might look like if you have, you know, different levels of speed and maturity and one particular region, which has, you know, close to 2 billion people at some point, which is way ahead and what that means with the technology as important with AI. And that's very important. Anecdotally, the UK and the US just signed an alliance earlier this week to combine forces on AI thought leadership, 
one of the drivers is to try and counter the balance with, with the way China's racing ahead. And the third piece, probably the most important, I should have thought with that, is really the relationship between humans and machines, where I see, you know, two scenarios, I guess. One is where we, you know, AI will continue to learn and, and, and progress, no doubt about that. And humanity, I worry whether, and I, I wrote an article on that, on the future of strategic decision making, whether if we don't register how we can add value to that equation and what it means to be human and what AI is doing, and we don't progress as quickly as AI is, or even for our own areas where we are strong, and they're many, I worry that we might end up with AI racing ahead and the sort of relative relationship of humanity not being able to add that much value. Conversely, there's a positive scenario, which is all of this is a wake up call. We understand that the knowledge driven educational system and many other of the institutions are not working. And we kind of make sure that, you know, we move to the next stage of development of humanity, addressing the right kind of skills and the right kind of value added in terms of that relationship with AI. Yes, yes. Roger, as always, it is a privilege to hear you speak and to listen to you and to learn from you. What I'm hearing is that we need, as of now, meaningful conversations, continuing meaningful conversations on all levels and government in organizations across societies, across geo um, areas. Um, I hope that that could happen. Roger, it was a privilege to speak to you. Thank you very much uh, for making time. I hope we can welcome you in South Africa soon. Um, it would be very nice to have you close and listen to you locally. For sure. Such an honor, Doris. Um, a wonderful organization you, you, you guys are running and um, very important topics. Thanks for having me.